Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here tonight with you. Thank you, Peter, for that introduction. And, um, and it's wonderful to be here at Nalion and uh, be able to teach the class on wisdom and to give this lecture tonight on a topic that's dear to my uh, heart and, and interest. I think it's one of the most important uh, things to know about interpretation. And, um, and so I'm going to uh, immediately, while hoping that you got a copy of the outline, I want to warn you that I'm going to change it. <laughs> At the end, basically, I'm going to present a case for uh, reading the Old Testament in the light of Christ, and then I'm going to give some examples. And I realized uh, earlier today when I was lecturing on wisdom that two of my examples I'm going to do in class. So why am I doing it here tonight? I'm going to bore my uh, students in my regular class. Um, but if any of you are interested in my thoughts on Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs, uh, just, just ask away afterwards. So, and I'm going to talk for a period of time, and we're going to end around 7.30, but I'm uh, planning on leaving 10, 15 minutes approximately for questions. So please have some questions so we're not just staring blankly at each other. Um, so, let me dive in here. Basically, the issue is a long-standing one for Christians through the ages, which is, what's the relationship between the Old and New Testament? And there are all kinds of different hermeneutical schools surrounding that question. Everything, just to use a couple of examples, uh, from say, dispensationalism and certain forms of Lutheran hermeneutics, which tend to make a big difference, say, between law and grace. And, uh, and on the other side, I don't think there are many representatives left these days, but there was in the 80s a group called Theonymous, who uh, basically thought that there was strict continuity between the covenants. And as I was telling my class earlier today, somehow I always end up in the middle of these uh, polar uh, extremes of approach to a question. And, and I also should say that we're really focusing in on one aspect of that question, and that is uh, how does Christ relate to the Old Testament? And many Christians think yeah, of course, you can find Christ in the Old Testament. There are a handful of striking messianic prophecies and psalms that are quoted often in the New Testament. And yes, of course, there's this expectation that we see in the Old Testament that is picked up on in the New Testament. But I would suggest to you tonight that the relationship between the Old and New Testament as it centers on Christ is much more pervasive than that, and that Jesus himself uh, taught about this issue. And, and let me also say, as we get into it, that this particular issue is absolutely critical, I think, for proper preaching of the Old Testament. And I'll talk a little bit more about why I think that at the end after we look at it, but I, I think this is just not a academic question, not even a question just about reading the Old and New Testament. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an issue that leads to powerful preaching from the Old Testament. So um, my view is that this question is actually easily answered because our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, spent the entire time between his resurrection and ascension talking about Old Testament hermeneutics. And it warms an Old Testament professor's heart to see this, that Jesus himself sees this as an absolutely critical question. So let's turn to Luke 24. Luke 24. 
And I won't read the whole chapter, but many of you know that Luke 24 contains uh, two speeches by Jesus uh, that are in the context of of, uh, of encounters with his disciples, the first encounter being the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. So uh, let me pick it up in verse 13, where it says, That very day two of them, disciples, were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. When they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish one, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interprets to them in all the scriptures the thing concerning himself. And and then later he meets a broader group of disciples and he says essentially the same thing but using different language. I'll pick it up in verse 44. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So I believe that what Jesus is saying is that the entire Old Testament, defined as Moses and the prophets, or according to the three-part canon of first century Jews, the law, the prophets, and the writings here identified by the first book of the writings, the Psalms, all point to his coming. So, um, so first of all, one of the first questions I want to ask is, was this expected or a surprise? And here, we're dealing with a debate among those scholars who do uh, Christological, or as I'll describe it in a moment, Christotelic interpretation. Uh, Maybe I should explain those terms. Christological uh, comes from, of course, Christ plus Logos, and seems to emphasize that it's of the essence of the Old Testament, where Christotelic from telos, or goal, is emphasizing the fact that the message concerning Christ in the Old Testament is a goal that's seen in the light of the resurrection. And this is what I mean by expected or surprised. Uh, in other words, should the people have known about Jesus before the event that unfolded in Jerusalem, or was it contingent on the resurrection so that it would open the eyes of the people to recognize that the Old Testament spoke of Christ? And so you have, on the one hand, scholars who insist that uh, all the matters concerning Christ and the New Testament use of the Old Testament as applies to Christ was recognized to some extent 
by the Old Testament authors themselves. So Greg Beal is a good example. Greg Beal of Westminster Seminary is a good example of a scholar who wants to tie this anticipation of Christ to the conscious intention of the Old Testament authors. He recognizes that as you read the New Testament, sometimes the use of the New Test- Old Testament and the New Testament strikes us as surprising. So he, though, insists that at a minimum, the intention, at a minimum, that expectation was part of what he calls the cognitive peripheral vision of the prophet. Now, um, I think that just by virtue of thinking about that label, it seems like an act of desperation because it's, it's just a way of saying, I can't really prove it exegetically that the human author of the Old Testament knows it, but it must have been somewhere out there in their consciousness somewhere that what they were writing somehow anticipated Christ. And we're thinking here of passages like uh, when Matthew in the um, infancy narrative quotes Hosea 12, out of Egypt I called my son, uh, in reference to Joseph and Mary bringing Jesus up from, um, from Egypt after trying to escape Herod. And uh, if you go back to Hosea and read it, it seems as if the prophet is looking back to the Exodus and not thinking of this as some kind of future prophetic moment. On the other hand, you have scholars like uh, Peter Rand, uh, a former student of mine, good friend, uh, and Richard Hayes, uh, uh, another good friend, but uh, 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 Greg is too, okay. But uh, it's a small world. So uh, Richard and Peter uh, want to argue, on the other hand, that it was only um, in the light of the resurrection that, that, that the people could see that the Old Testament points to Christ. Now, as you think about it, you can see arguments for and against both those perspectives. Um, when you think about... Um, the end Hayes view, just using them as an example, uh, it's, and you read the Gospels, you realize that no one seemed to get it, right? As you're reading the Gospel, it's not like people are going around going, yeah, I know he's going to the cross, but just give it three days and uh, everything will be fine. No, they're like these uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus. They're confused. So that would tempt one to think that you really had to wait for the resurrection. However, on the other side, you have Jesus' response to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He doesn't say, yeah, I get it, I had to be raised. He says, how foolish you are. How foolish you are. You should have known. So, um, So my own view is that there was an expectation that that audience in the first century should have been aware of, an expectation, say, of a coming deliverer, a fulfillment of the promise of a Davidic descendant on the throne forever. There should have been at least the vague contours of expectation, but that it probably did take the um, the full realization of the resurrection to completely open the eyes of the disciples in the first century. I always like to use an example of either reading a good, suspenseful book a second time or watching a movie a second time. Now, I've used this movie for decades, it seems, since it first came out, uh, and you may not be a movie-going audience. As I look around, I'm not sure. So <laughs> you're Baptist, no? <laughs> so uh, how many of you have ever seen a movie called The Sixth Sense, starring Bruce Willis? Okay, so 
So you could plug in any movie or even any uh, good novel, uh, but I'll give you a quick reprise of the plot, just to remind you. So Bruce Willis is playing a child psychologist. And at the beginning of the movie, he's just coming back to his home with his wife after winning something like Child Psychologist of the Year. And he notices the windows open, and then behind a curtain, somebody steps out, apparently a disgruntled former patient, and shoots him. The screen goes dark. When the action starts again, it's some months later, and, and you know, Bruce, the Bruce Willis character is, is back at work, and he's counseling a young boy who thinks he sees dead people, right? And you're watching this interchange, and you're going, this kid might be seeing dead people. I hope he can convince, you know, uh, Bruce Willis that he does. And then the other subplot is going on is Bruce Willis is having difficulty relating to his wife. She seems to be distant. She even seems to be talking intimately with other men, and something's happening to the relationship. Well, if you see in the movie, you know that finally you find out that the kid can see dead people because Bruce Willis is dead. <laughs> and uh, now you go back and watch the movie the second time, and you have all these, oh, oh yeah, now I get it. No wonder he's having trouble relating to his wife. He's dead. <laughs> so uh, I always go to the movie with movies like that with my wife, and she spoils it. I said, you need to suspend your disbelief when you watch movies like this. But in any case, you get my point. John Levinson, the, the well-known and very in, uh, insightful Jewish scholar, taught, has been teaching at Harvard for many years, he talks about how, of course, Christians are going to read the Old Testament in the light of Christ. To ask them to do anything else would be like asking a Shakespeare scholar to study the first act of Hamlet with that, pretending he doesn't know what happened in the third act, right? So the point is, as we, we as Christians, when we go back and read the Old Testament in the light of what happens in the New Testament, we should be having a lot of those aha moments. It should be clear to us uh, what Jesus meant when he said that the entire Old Testament anticipated him. Okay, so I, I raise the question of Christological or Christotelic, and sometimes those two terms are used in that debate between the beals of the world and the ends of the world, um, and maybe you could tell that I find myself, or I consider myself, somewhere between the two, so I tend to use the terms interchangeably. By the way, we may be having the person who actually coined the term Christotelic in the front row here, uh, Professor Douglas Green, another former student of mine and colleague, and uh, a Pete Enns, and so... Uh, we used to sit around and talk about these issues a lot. And uh, I think Pete then thought he invented it, but he didn't. Doug and I know who did. So, <laughs> so in any case, um, I'll use the terms interchangeably. Now, the next thing I want to emphasize is the fact that even though this is true, it's absolutely critical when you read the Old Testament, particularly for those of us who want to preach from it or teach from it or write about it, that we first hear the discrete voice of the Old Testament. That's a phrase that comes from Brevard Childs from Yale, who is well known for developing the canonical approach. Uh, Walter Brueggemann, another well-known Old Testament scholar, uh, worries about you know, taming the Old Testament if you too quickly move to a kind of New Testament perspective on the Old Testament. We need to, when we're studying a particular passage, ask the question, what did it mean to the original audience who didn't know the full story? Otherwise, we may too quickly go to a Christological analysis and miss all the richness of the Old Testament uh, revelation. I was telling my class this afternoon that when I wrote my Dano commentary in the NIVAC series, I 
sent the first edition to my uh, editor and good, another good friend, John Walton, who, who doesn't do any kind of, he's an example of an evangelical who doesn't do Christological or Christotelic interpretation, partly because he worries that by doing so, you do uh, miss the witness of the Old Testament to God. And, uh, and I sent it to him, and he sent it back, and he goes, I know I'm not going to convince you not to do this kind of reading, but I do want to draw your attention to the fact that you've gone too quickly, that you haven't thought about what do we learn about Yahweh and our relationship with Yahweh before you look at it from... So I, it wasn't that I didn't do it at all, but I, I, uh, I was doing it too quickly. And I took his point of view, and I went back and worked with the text, and I think it was a stronger commentary for that, because John uh, is well known for reminding us that, you know, the Bible, the books of the Bible were not written to us. It wasn't written to us. The authors of the Bible didn't sit around going, I'm going to write this for the ages, and I'm really glad those Australians and Americans in the 21st century are going to get something out of this. So I want to make it, I want to write it in a way that transcends my culture. No, they're writing to their particular audience. So we have to, again, using a phrase from John, uh, we have to enter their cognitive environment and not too quickly impose our 21st century, in our case, Western ideas on the text. So, uh, so that's why I say we need to do a first reading and a second reading of Old Testament texts to get the fullest out of them. Now, I will just really quickly tell you that when John wrote his Genesis commentary in the NIVAC series, and I was his editor, I did the opposite. I said, John, uh, this is a great analysis of the book of Genesis in its original setting, but you know, the New Testament actually sometimes quotes the, the book of Genesis. And shouldn't you consider, you know, how the book of Genesis is used in the New Testament? And he sent it back to me with no changes. <laughs> so, uh, but still a valuable commentary for what it is. We wrote a book on Job together, uh, How to Read Job, and he approached me about, let's do a book on Job together. I said, you don't do Christological analysis. He said, you write that chapter. <laughs> okay, so I thought I'd give you a few examples, because the proof is in the pudding. And, you know, just because there are good ways and bad ways of doing this kind of work. And... Um, and so I thought I'd come up with a couple of examples. Um, obviously, that won't prove that every part of the Old Testament anticipates Christ. And if you throw a passage at me, I might have to think about it a little bit more, but I haven't met an Old Testament passage that hasn't anticipated Christ yet. <laughs> uh, but again, it's not like Christ is under every verse. Sometimes it's in the context of a larger portion of Scripture. And you really do have to be careful of sort of imposing an arbitrary meaning on the text in, say, an allegorical fashion. So uh, on Friday, my class is going to study the Song of Songs, and one of the things we're going to look at is uh, the allegorical interpretation of the Song of Songs, where people said, yeah, um, Jesus, I mean, the, the man in the Song of Songs is Jesus, and the woman is the church. And there's absolutely no justification within the book of Song of Songs to say that kind of thing. There are uh, Christological trajectories from the Song of Songs that we're also going to be talking about, but that's not it. So I thought I would talk about the tabernacle, and then I thought I'd take a text that uh, is illustrative of a a major metaphor of God in the Old Testament that a number of you might not have thought about, that indeed, if you have thought about it, you might think rather than 
being on a trajectory into the New Testament is actually a sign of discontinuity with the New Testament, namely God is a warrior, God coming and warring on behalf of his people. So let me start with a few comments on the tabernacle. As you look at Exodus 25 to 40, uh, in its Old Testament context, trying to understand how did, what did the tabernacle and the description of its construction communicate to the Old Testament people who build it and then worship there, um, I would begin by pointing out that the tabernacle is God's tent. It's God's tent. It's a pretty ornate tent because it's the king's tent. And, um, and so it's described as having four curtains. Exodus 26 talks about the four curtains that overlay the uh, acacia walls. Uh, the one that is, I think, symbolically significant is the innermost curtain, the one that you can see within the tabernacle. The other three are essentially weatherproofing that overlay this very precious curtain, which is described as essentially a, a deep blue with the figures of cherubim worked into that. As you think about it, think about walking into the tabernacle, which you shouldn't do without priestly guidance, uh, and looking up at the roof and seeing this deep blue uh, roof with the cherubim, and you would realize that you are in heaven on earth. That the tabernacle is a symbol of heaven where, uh, where God makes his presence known. And so, it's interesting that all the symbolism points to God's presence being concentrated in the back third, namely the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant is. Now, the Ark of the Covenant is called God's footstool in a couple of places. And you have over the Ark of the Covenant two cherubim. Uh, by the way, the cherubim are part of God's heavenly army. They're his spiritual bodyguard. They are, this is an American reference, God sealed team six. They're his most special, special forces. And um, I need to contextualize that to Australia. Somebody will tell me afterwards. But in any case, um, so you'll see that they have their heads lowered, their wings outstretched. Their heads are lowered because God is imagined as enthroned above the ark. He speaks between the cherubim. So when you go to the back well, which you shouldn't unless you're the high priest once a year, uh, as you imagine the back third of the tabernacle, uh, that is God's throne room. He is enthroned there. And so the very layout of the tabernacle uh, is pointing to the fact that the closer you get to the Holy of Holies, the more intense the holiness is. Uh, Bill Prop, William Prop, uh, a scholar who wrote a commentary on Exodus in the uh, Anchor Bible series, draws an analogy to help us understand this with a modern nuclear reactor. He says, uh, the Holy of Holies is like the nuclear core, and the closer you get to it, the more you're being bombarded by holiness rays. And it's, uh, it's, it's symbolized by the placement of the metal. Where at the very outside of the curtains that separate the courtyard, there's bronze. As you move in, it turns to silver. Then it becomes gold. Then it becomes uh, pure gold, a higher quality gold. So it is even the placement of the metals themselves is symbolizing that God is making His presence known on earth. And then, of course, the uh, the gradation of holiness that's coming out of the Holy of Holies is also uh, behind uh, the restricted access to the Holy of Holies. 
So outside the camp is the camp is the realm of the Gentile and the unclean. When you come into the camp, you need to be a ritually clean uh, Israelite. Um, the Levites are the ones who are camped around immediately around the uh, tabernacle because uh, they are God's bodyguards. I'll come back to that in a moment. Human bodyguards defending and guarding the covenant, defending and guarding the holy place. And then once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest with great trepidation can go into the Holy of Holies. So just in terms of restricted access, it also symbolizes this gradation of holiness. Now, uh, I just mentioned uh, we should imagine the Levites as God's bodyguards, and this reflects the fact that the book of Numbers, uh, as it's describing the layout of the camp and the wilderness march, are very much thinking of Israel in the wilderness as God's army on the march into a battle. After all, Numbers chapter 1 uh, counts what? Uh, men 20 and older armed for battle. And then the layout of the camp is like an ancient Near Eastern war camp where the, the war leader, the king's tent, is in the middle surrounded by their bodyguards. The Levites are told to have their tents around it. And then the rest of the army placed in various locations to the north, south, east, and west. And then in Numbers chapter 10, verse uh, 35, I think it is, might be 34, Remember, when they break camp, Moses is to say the following words. Rise up, O Lord, and scatter the countless enemies of Israel. At that point, the Holy of Holies is taken out of the, I mean, the Ark of the Covenant is taken out of the Holy of Holies and leads the Israelites in the march uh, toward the next camping location. So that is, oh, one more little tidbit here. Um... Think of the menorah. The menorah is also a very um, pregnant symbol. If you read the description of the menorah in Exodus 25, it'll talk about how it has branches and blossoms. And then you realize that the menorah, the lampstand, is a tree symbol. It's a tree in the midst of the holy place where God makes his presence known among human beings, which, of course, is reminiscent of the Garden of Eden. So as you read about the tabernacle in the Old Testament, you're to think this is heaven on earth. God is making his presence known, his special presence known among his people. And it's also Eden, a remembrance of Eden. Okay, now let's do a second reading. How does the tabernacle anticipate Christ? And there's some popular books out there that do allegorical readings. There's one by a man named Paul Keeney, maybe used to be popular, K-I-E-N-E. And he goes on and talks about things like the red in the tabernacle symbolizes the cross, the death of Christ. The blue is Jesus' royal color. And you're going, why would I ever interpret it that way? If I, first of all, understand it in terms of its Old Testament uh, setting. No, there's, uh, there's uh, another trajectory into the New Testament. But I'll take you there via Eden, the tabernacle, the temple, and then eventually to Jesus. So you start in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is the place where human beings can dwell in God's presence. But because of sin, they're ejected from the Garden of Eden, and there's a barrier between sinful humanity and holy God. So you can no longer gain easy access into God's special presence. But God, in his graciousness, um, he allows for the presence of holy places, beginning with simple altars. 
So um, the first altar that's mentioned is the altar that Noah builds in Genesis 9 after the flood, but it's presupposed as early as Cain and Abel as they're offering sacrifices. Because in Hebrew, an altar is a mizbeach, namely a place of sacrifice. So, yes, uh, God's people can approach the holy place, uh, the altar, with great trepidation, and bring a sacrifice to acknowledge their sin. It's also interesting, by the way, to see that in the Abraham narrative, it's mentioned a couple times that Abraham builds altars next to trees, which, again, I think is a, a reminder of Eden. But eventually, the people of God grow beyond that of extended family, and so God instructs Moses to build a tabernacle, and uh, which is a larger place symbolizing the presence of God, befitting now a fledgling nation who are God's people. But this proves to be a temporary arrangement because in Deuteronomy 12, we have what's called the law of centralization, where God says to Moses, um, in the future, when God gives you, when I give you rest from your enemies round about, I will then choose a place and it will be that you can only offer sacrifices at that place. So what triggers that? What triggers that is David, David, who is the one who completes the conquest. Joshua, of course, had uh, the beginning victories, but there were still lots of Canaanites left in the land after Joshua, and there was continued fighting. But David is the one who completes the conquest. He can't build, he, you know, 2 Samuel 7, which is... Uh, an interesting passage that plays on the Hebrew word bayet or house, where David says, hey, you know, I have this really nice house. I need to build God a house. Nathan says, good idea, build God a house. And that night, God said to Nathan, who told you to build me a house? And you're going, why is God so irritated? <laughs> who told David? And he goes on and on about, and then he goes, I'm not going to let David build me a house. I'm going to build him a house. And that's where, you know, house in terms of dynasty. And then, first of all, the reason why God is a little annoyed is that it's very clear from the tabernacle narrative that human beings should not initiate house building for God. So David is initiating house building. And so God said, you're not going to build it, but your son, Shlomo, I wanted to say it in Hebrew because you can hear it, peaceful one. Uh, he inherits the established kingdom, so he's the one who will appropriately build the building, which will symbolize uh, the end of the conquest, establishment within the land, with those great pillars, Boaz and Yabin, he shall establish by his strength. And that tremendous labor of water called the sea, the sea symbolizes chaos, which has now been pacified. And so, um, yeah, David can't do it because he's a man of blood, Chronicles says. Not that he's morally disqualified, but because he's God's warrior. But of course, the people presume on the temple, they put idols in it, and eventually the temple is uh, destroyed by the Babylonians. Yes, it is rebuilt after the return from the exile, uh, but not with the same fanfare. And it's interesting that there's no mention of the glory of God filling that temple. It's also interesting that the exile continues. That's Daniel 9. It's not, it's, in one sense, the exile comes to a kind of conclusion when Cyrus issues the decree to allow them to go back. But in another sense, they're still living under foreign oppression. So, Gabriel says, after Daniel prays, after reading about Jeremiah 70 years, he goes, no, 77, 70 times 7. In other words, the exile is going to continue. And we come into the New Testament, and now you've got this grand temple that's been built up by Herod. But Jesus starts saying some interesting things about it, right? He says, tear down this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up again. 
Um, and of course, um, the reason why the temple is no longer needed is because Jesus is the fulfillment of the expectation of the temple and the tabernacle. Um, you know, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. As older translations translated it, the Greek word skeneo, from related to the noun, Greek noun, skene, which means tabernacle. So tabernacle among us. Um, Jesus is the very presence of God. And we won't go into all the details, but as you read through the New Testament and into Paul, um, we read about how Jesus is the presence of God and that he sends the Holy Spirit to be with us and to dwell in us so that we individually and corporately are the temple of God. But this isn't even the end of the story because uh, as you read in the book of Revelation, Revelation 21, as the New Jerusalem is being described, it, it goes out of its way to say, and there will be no temple in the city. Right after it says there will be no beach and no no sea in the city, which always disappointed me because I like beaches. But but of course what it's saying is there'll be no chaos in the city. And here there's no temple because God dwells in the city. And then in Revelation 22, we hear about the river that flows through it with two trees of life, symbolizing a return to Eden, but better than Eden. So again, that's the kind of thing where I'm talking about when I talk about how does the Old Testament anticipate Christ. Another example, and I'm going to have to be too brief here, um, for those interested, I have a book coming out that, <laughs> that talks about divine violence, that uh, develops these things. And, and the example I'm using, I'm thinking, what example will I use of the many, many passages in the Old Testament that talks about God as a warrior. And I thought I could choose any of them. And and as I recently thought about it, um, every book of the Old Testament, with the exception of Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs and maybe Ruth, uh, has some reference to God as a warrior or God uh, exercising violence by means of judgment. It's, it's a pervasive theme of the Old Testament. But I thought I'd go way back to the beginning of my career, for old times' sake, and read uh, Nahum chapter 1. I wrote a commentary in the 80s on Nahum. Notice how Nahum opens. He goes, The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. Uh, and the Lord will by no means spare the guilty. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell in it. And this opening picture of God as a warrior uh, then leads into a judgment oracle against the city of Nineveh, which has been oppressive toward other people in the Near East, including Judah. And it's anticipating the fall of Nineveh in 612 BC. Uh, but, but what are we to make of this picture of God as a warrior? And is it in tension with the New Testament. And I would say, no, it indeed uh, provides a trajectory from the Old Testament into the New Testament. God appears as a warrior a number of times in the Old Testament, sometimes fighting against Israel's flesh and blood enemies. Think Jericho. Uh, think David fighting the Philistines in the Valley of Rephaim, on and on. Sometimes, when Israel is disobedient, um, God fights against Israel, 
Think of their defeat at the city of Ai. Think of the early chapters of Samuel when the Ark of the Covenant is taken by the Philistines back to the temple of Dagon. Think of the defeat of Jerusalem by the Babylonians that is bemoaned or lamented by the book of Lamentations where God is described as an enemy. But the, but the, the, the sort of transitional part of the Old Testament that leads us to the New Testament comes with the exilic and post-exilic prophets. And what the exilic and post-exilic prophets put before us is a, is a vision of the return of the divine warrior. God is a warrior who will free them from their oppression. The well-known Daniel 7. The oppressors are represented by hybrid beasts coming out of a chaotic sea. Uh, God's future victory is represented by one like the Son of Man who rides into the presence of the, the Ancient of Days and then goes out and defeats the beast. Or Zechariah 14 that talks about a day of the Lord is coming. Malachi 4, we could go on. So the expectation at the end of the Old Testament time period, as the Old Testament draws to a close, is that God the warrior is going to come in the future. We turn to the New Testament, and the first voice that we hear is that of John the Baptist. What does John the Baptist say? I'm going to baptize one greater than I am, and this one is going to gather all the chaff and burn it with unquenchable fire. This one is going to take an axe and chop out all the rotten wood. Jesus is about, so he's, what John the Baptist is doing is picking up the message of Daniel 7, Zechariah 14, Malachi 4, and elsewhere. He sees Jesus is the one. He baptizes him. John gets thrown in jail. Jesus goes out and does his ministry. John hears reports about what Jesus is doing. He's healing the sick. He's exercising demons. He's preaching the good news. John hears these reports, and he says to himself, I think I baptized the wrong guy. And then he sends two disciples in Matthew 11 up to Jesus with the question, Are you the one, or should you expect another? Where's the axe chopping, Jesus? Where's the chaff burning? And of course, Jesus goes out and does more of the same. He goes out and preaches, heals, exercises demons. Go back and tell John what he's seen. What message is Jesus sending to John? He's saying, I am the divine warrior. I am the one who has been anticipated by the Old Testament expectation of the warrior. But, John, I have heightened and intensified the battle so it is directed toward the spiritual powers and authority. And this enemy, John, isn't defeated by sword and spear. This enemy is not even defeated by killing, but rather by dying. So this battle takes me to the cross, which is why, by the way, Paul uses military language to describe the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension in passages like Colossians 2, 13 to 15. Particularly 15, I'll skip right to 15 because I'm running a little long. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. ESP can be a little awkward sometimes. But in any case, <laughs> um, so, but was John the Baptist wrong? Again, as we develop these biblical theological trajectories, which I think are so fruitful in understanding how the Old Testament anticipates, uh, the New Te Old Testament anticipates the New Testament, the answer is no. But John spoke better than he knew. He didn't know that Christ was going to come twice. And so the ultimate, um, the ultimate um, kind of fulfillment of the expectation is found in places like Mark 13 or Revelation 19, 
which describes Jesus' return in order to bring judgment against the human enemies and the spiritual enemies of God. Well, uh, I went a little longer than I expected, um, but I hope to kind of illustrate the kind of study of the Old Testament, first of all in its original setting, but then to get the discreet message of the Old Testament, but then thinking of it from the perspective of the New Testament. So I'll just conclude and hopefully have a few minutes here for questions uh, by saying I hope you can see how important this is for preaching the Old Testament and why it's so wrong to think that the Old Testament is irrelevant to us as Christians. Um, it's relevant in many ways. Indeed, uh, to read the New Testament without reading the Old Testament is like, again, to use a movie analogy, going to the movies with my father when I was young. My father never checked what time movies actually started. we just go, and then we'd watch it, and so let's say we'd show up and there's 15 minutes left, we'd watch the end, and then you'd say, okay, let's wait till it starts again. <laughs> And then come to the last 15 minutes and he'd go, okay, we saw this, let's go. I'm going, well, first of all, to read the New Testament without reading the Old Testament is not even staying for the first part again. And all I can say is there may be a little bit of excitement to a ending a dramatic movie, but you sure don't know what the heck is going on. And that's what happens if you just read the New Testament and not the Old Testament. And when you preach the Old Testament, you know, Understanding that the whole Old Testament anticipates the coming of Christ means that as you look into this and see, um, you know, viable trajectories into the New Testament, that will allow you to preach Christ, which I think uh, Christian preachers should always do. So those are some comments. I hope I stimulated your thinking. But we could go on. I mean, there. Uh, I need to draw to close pretty soon. But you can. Um, I, I gave examples of sort of the presence of God when we looked at the tabernacle, and then we looked at, uh, you know, God as a warrior. Uh, there are a whole host of other trajectories, more than I can mention now. But say the Exodus theme and how the Gospels themselves. Uh, describe Jesus' ministry in analogy with, particularly Matthew, in analogy with the Exodus in order to show that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Exodus. Uh, Jesus is uh, better than Exodus. Or, of course, a favorite among us Reformed people, um, the covenant, you know, and as the old covenant anticipates the new covenant which fulfills all the old covenant, uh, we could talk about a whole number of different kind of um, trajectories. But I, I thank you for uh, for coming tonight. I um, sorry I went a little longer, didn't allow much time for questions, but I appreciate your questions and your attention. <laughs>